So uh, back when I saw the first Pacific Rim, I went to go see it with a couple of friends because I was back in Ohio visiting for a while. And uh, we went to go see that over uh, Grown Ups, I believe. Was it Grown Ups or Grown Ups 2? I can't remember. It was one of the Grown Ups movies. It was kind of like 50-50. Half of us wanted to see a Pacific Rim, half of us wanted to see Grown Ups. And uh, Pacific Rim won out just because the timing was better, I guess. And one of my friends, uh, Josh, who I've had on the McChats podcast before, uh, ever since then, he's kind of given me... Uh, he, and jokingly giving me grief about liking Pacific Rim. He's like, how can you like something that stupid? You know what? We all like stupid stuff. We all like dumb stuff. We all like stuff that is, you know, when you get down to the core of it, inherently dumb. Every critically acclaimed Marvel movie out there that you enjoy, guess what? It comes from an inherently dumb place. People dressing up in silly costumes with silly, um, unrealistic powers. But it's what you take and what you do with those inherently dumb premises and you're able to make them maybe more interesting, more personalized, more uh, something with more emotional heft to it than what it would typically be. Because I'd take the first Pacific Rim and honestly I'd take this Pacific Rim over any of the Transformers movies. Even the first one which I kinda sorta tolerate. Visually there's something more interesting going on than just two metal heaps having sex with each other which is what the Transformers fight scenes oftentimes look like. There's characterization there, they might not necessarily be the most memorable characters, but at least they aren't, like, too gratingly annoying, like your Sam Witwickies, or your Mark Wahlberg, I don't even remember what the name of his character is, or your Stanley Tucci yelling his head off. It's a dumb idea. Big robots punching monsters. It's a tale as old as the hills. But Guillermo del Toro in that first movie was able to really kind of craft a cool world, a cool vibe, and some pretty interesting supporting players to make the viewing experience a little bit more engaging than it would have been. Yeah, Charlie Hunnam's lead in the first movie isn't the most interesting lead, but thank God we've got character actors like Idris Elba, we've got Charlie Day and uh, Byrne Gorman in uh, supporting roles. We had Ron Perlman, which honestly, yeah, I was kind of disappointed he didn't show up for a little bit at one point in this movie. You had some interesting creature designs, interesting robot designs. The action sequences, like I said, were very kinetic and tight, and you can tell what's going on, and they look visceral and gritty. Everything Del Toro did geared towards making you enjoy that experience, even though deep down in your reptile brain you know that this experience is stupid inherently at its core. With Pacific Rim Uprising, a lot of that still kind of stands true, but this is definitely... I, the best way I could describe it is you can tell that this is Del Toro relegating himself to producer credit on this. They try very hard to kind of emulate the style and the aesthetic that he went for in that first movie, but it's just not quite there, which kind of makes these proceedings Overall, just okay. The movie takes place ten years after uh, the end of the first film, and basically humanity has rebuilt a lot of its society. A lot of the major cities are still decimated because those battles, you know, decimate huge areas of land. And you have a lot of uh, people scrounging or uh, squatting in these big metropolitan areas and kind of trading goods and services for things like that. And also you have uh, John Boyega's character, who is the son of Idris Elba's character from the first film, you have him kind of scrounging and scavenging Jaeger parts for bare essentials. Like, all that stuff is kind of cool. It's kind of cool to see that it's not in the Independence Day resurgence vein with, in that regard, in that it's all of a sudden a big scientific utopia because they've taken all the technology and stuff and advanced it further from their previous experiences. Now it's actually kind of crappy here and there. He ends up meeting this uh, girl who has put together her own her own Jaeger robot, uh, a smaller Jaeger robot named Scrapper, which the second you see this Jaeger in action you realize yeah that's not gonna come back to play in the last act of the movie at all. They both get uh, arrested uh, for, I guess, salvaging parts illegally, illegally. and uh, the, one of the only returning characters from the first movie, uh, Mako, basically the half-sister or <coughs> stepsister of John Boyega's character, 
recruits both of them into the new Jaeger training program. Essentially, the idea is, is that Charlie Day's character is working with this with this industrialist to make drone armies of Jaegers for future protection and things of that nature. And so Mako isn't quite sure about that and wants like new Jaeger pilots trained. So you get that aesthetic of it where he's brought back into the fold. He has a rivalry sort of with Scott Eastwood who I guess 10 years prior they were competitive pilots and things like that. And so they got to kind of work together now as co-instructors for these young cadets. Meanwhile, a rogue uh, Jaeger terrorizes at certain points. And uh, it's revealed kind of what's going on, which ultimately leads to the revelation of Jaeger uh, kaiju hybrids that have been manufactured by some unseen force taking over fault points at the specific uh, at the Pacific Rim to unleash another opening into the kaiju world or the alien world that releases the kaiju into our world though there's some interesting ideas at play certainly in this movie the idea of the society that hasn't quite gotten back on its feet the idea of these two competitive pilots kind of having to come to terms with their past and have to work together to help train these new people into the program and the idea of the kaiju Jaeger uh, hybrids being the enemy essentially like it's not you don't really get the full-on monster robot experience until the very last action sequence but everything just feels so I don't know automatic pilot in this movie that it's just okay like I kinda felt that way going into the movie that I wasn't going to have my expectations blown out of the water by this film. Um, I still watch the first film. I own the first film and watch it regularly and I'm still impressed with what a lot of actors are doing in that, what a lot of the action sequences consist of, and just the scope of it. And though they try to go for grander or more elaborate action sequences in this movie, like you'll have uh, the new Gypsy Jaeger essentially using like an anti-grav or magnetic type of uh, pulse to chuck metal at uh, opponents. Like at one point it's chucking like buildings or like just bringing buildings down on this kaiju. That's interesting and that's cool but at no point did, well, did I feel as wowed as I did when the original Gypsy broke out its uh, sword in the first movie to fight the flying kaiju above the uh, earth. It just felt like they really wanted to go bigger and better than the original, but it was just falling short. I feel it has to deal a lot with the fact that Guillermo del Toro isn't at the helm necessarily of this uh, project. He's taken kind of a back seat as a producer and more is just kind of consulting. The director of the movie, uh, Stephen DeKnight, He's done a lot of writing, producing, and directing on the television front of things. I think this is his feature film debut as a director. He did a lot of work for Buffy, for Angel, uh, Smallville, and uh, a, a lot of work on the early seasons of the Marvel Netflix shows. Like, he was all over Daredevil. I'd say this is a very competent C, average C job that he's doing with this material. I'm sure it's no small task to be able to step in for Del Toro, but he's trying his best, Stephen Knight, to carry the torch a little bit and to pass on some of the D Del Toro Mobius type aesthetic that he established in the first movie. It's not quite there, but it's okay, like I said. Not quite there is better than Michael Bay Transformers. So I'll take this over that drag any day of the week. Because at least I wasn't annoyed while the action sequences didn't quite take my breath away the way they, the way they did originally in the first one. They, they're still interesting enough and engaging enough for me to kind of be like, yeah, this is kind of cool. There was a certain point when it came to the characterization of some characters that I was almost dreading a certain subplot that was taking place, kinda sorta, and that was the uh, cadets training. You don't really see a lot of that, and I'm kind of relieved because there were moments where it kind of felt like Pacific Rim was going to be veering into young adult territory, 
with these really young cadets, and it's almost like an Ender's Game style rivalry certain cadets have against each other. Like the girl that John Boyega meets, she is a pretty young cadet. You start to kind of think like, oh man, oh man, I hope she's not like a perpetual sidekick in this. She isn't really so much. She does very much contribute in the final fight, but thankfully the uh, actress isn't going for the gratingly annoying sidekick, a la Sam Witwicky. But she ends up having like sort of a rivalry with this other girl in the cadet training, even though it's briefly explained to us why this girl hates this other girl's guts, uh, basically because she worked hard to get into the program and this girl's just got handed everything. That's a pretty stereotypical reason to have a rivalry in that situation. But it's resolved like pretty immediately. <laughs> like you don't get a lot into that and probably for the better because I, I wouldn't find myself really latching on to that in, that in this particular movie. It, that, that just wasn't the interesting part of it for me. I don't know. Like, Pacific Rim, I really still genuinely enjoy. This movie hasn't retroactively killed off my interest in Pacific Rim, but even after leaving the first movie, I kind of felt like, okay, that's a nice one-and-done type of spectacle movie. I really didn't know if there would be enough there for... Uh, filmmakers to continue as a franchise and it looks like they're continuing it but they tried to uh, Independence Day Resurgence sequel bait and say that we as a species are gonna take the fight to the aliens now I'm very just meh about Pacific Rim Uprising like I mentioned before the average C grade for Stephen Deny as a director I'd overall I'd say the movie itself is a C grade for me if I had to assign some kind of rating to it I wasn't frustrated with the proceedings of Uprising. There were some moments where I'm kind of like, oh, please don't go this way. And thankfully, they didn't go this way. It was kind of just predictable and nothing too jaw-dropping or in terms of outdoing the spectacle of the original. But that's perfectly fine. It's competent enough. It's got adequate enough action sequences. I do like John Boyega as the lead here. I kind of wish they'd give him a little bit more to do, but frankly, uh, he's pretty solid as an action lead in this movie. Some of the back and forth between him and Scott Eastwood, or him and uh, the young girl, are actually kind of good performance-wise. So, there's, there's stuff there. I mean, if you're looking for a perfectly good hour and a half uh, time waster that you won't regret, this is probably it. It did go by pretty quick, actually. I was kind of thankful for that. It didn't feel like I was slogging through a two-plus-hour bore. It at least clipped along really well. So, there you go. Pacific Rim Uprising. And...